Good evening. Welcome to the Frontline Club. It's very nice that so many of you made it here despite the transport infelicities that we're suffering from in the capital today. Uh, and well you might, because uh, for me it's a great pleasure here to be speaking to uh, Jumana, who has written this tremendous book, I Kill Shirazada, Confessions of an Angry Arab Woman. And there's a lot to talk about. We've got about an hour and a half. I'll talk a bit to Jumana. You guys can also speak to her, ask some questions. But I would like to start by just reading. She's going to read a bit later on, but um, just to introduce her a little bit. She's introduced herself in here. Um, defining herself. I hope this wasn't the bit you were going to read out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> let me grab the bull by the horns right from the start. I definitely am what you would call a woman with balls, but I don't have penis envy. I'm a highly paid career woman, but I hate having to pay the restaurant bill when a man takes me out on a date. I am an emancipated workaholic woman, but a massage and facial give me as much pleasure and fulfillment as successful job-related projects. I'm an intellectual woman, but I worry about my wrinkles and body weight as much as I worry about not having yet read The Last Kundera. <laughs> I'll go, a couple of, it's good, it's great. Nine, nine, page 96 is great. You've got to buy the book, though, to read the, <laughs> to read the rest of it. I am an initiative-taking woman, but I lose my, inverted commas, erection in front of a spineless, gutless man as quickly and as irrevocably as I lose it in front of a Neanderthal who thinks that visible chest hair, <laughs> shiny fast cars and behaving like a jerk are indispensable proofs of his masculinity. Uh, Jamala, first of all, uh, why are you angry? Well, first of all, um, Good evening. I'm so happy to be here, and thank you for coming. And thank you, Jeremy, for giving me the honor of doing this interview with me. Why am I angry? I think I'm angry because I have good eyesight, good hearing, and I, I'm aware of what's happening around me. And I think just having that makes you feel so angry about so many things happening in the world today. Think, to name a few things. What really gets you going, then? Well, um, first of all, let me talk about my, my world, because this is what basically I'm angry about. I'm angry about the schizophrenia that we are living in the Arab world, about all the double standards, the hypocrisy. There's a lot of hypocrisy, especially in Lebanon. Uh, but I know that it's everywhere as well. And I'm also angry, and that's one of the themes of this book, about the way uh, the West insists on seeing my world. I know that there are lots of things that are wrong in, in many Arab countries, if not in all of them. But there's this, like, um, insistence on putting us, um, uh, on, on, uh, on stucking us with a particular image, especially Arab women, which is, although part of it might be true, but it's not the whole truth. So all these cliches, all these generalizations about Arab women make me so angry. I don't even think there's something called an Arab woman. What is the Arab woman? I mean, there are so many of us out there, and we are so much different, and I think it's insulting for any human being to, treat, to be treated like a part of a herd instead of being seen as an individual. Okay, cliches are never good, yet. <coughs> the thing about cliches is they often have a bit of truth in them, don't yeah, they? Yeah, this is what I said. I know that, you know, the oppressed, victimized Arab woman exists, unfortunately. But there's also a different Arab woman, and I don't see her very often in, in Western media. What would you say if I said to you, look, I think you're an exceptional Arab woman insofar as you're not like most of the Arab women that I meet when I go to the Middle East? Well, you might be true. We are a minority. I mean, I know that there are lots of women like me, but we are a minority. But, I mean, what's the problem with that? Change and hope always come from minorities, and they need to, they deserve to be noticed. Now, you say in your book, you, in fact, you write it in capital letters, Arab women should think for themselves. Why can't they? Why don't they? I think there are 
two responsible uh, parties there because whenever there's a misunderstanding or a problem, I don't believe in one way, um, you know, uh, problems. Uh, so one responsible party is the whole system. I'm talking religion, I'm talking politics, I'm talking the patriarchal values that control the way uh, women lead their lives. But another very important responsible party is the woman herself, because many Arab women, and I like to responsibilize them, are their own worst enemy. So they're willing victims. They, they, they indulge themselves in this, you know, image of the victim. And because it's sometimes it could be seen as, and it could be easier than, you know, saying, no, I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm going to do something about it. And you could even, because I know that it might seem as a luxury, what I'm saying, for like a woman who is stuck in her house, can't drive her car, etc., etc. But it's not, because this same woman, like, I'm going to give you an example, is a mother. She's raising kids inside the house. Unfortunately, this mother, most of the times, and I hate generalizing, and I know you know that, raises her girl, her, her baby girl, to be just like her, and raises her baby boy to be just like what? the father or the husband or the brother, instead of doing something about it. What causes that conformity? It's like I said, it's like, um, I think it's, it becomes like a reflex. It's a kind of brainwashing. It's like when she says, I choose this life. I don't think anyone, I mean, who respects the fact that they're a human being can choose willingly this kind of a life and this kind of a, you know, humiliating condition. Uh, you, you mentioned it already, but I'd like to ex you to expand a bit on what you said about schizophrenia. You say that being an Arab means mastering the art of schizophrenia, depending on a web of comforting lies and superstitions. They've embezzled our culture and murdered it. Who, who, who's they? Oh, I'm, I'm talking about the political and religious systems. So the people with power. And who are accomplices together. And you know, it's about, it's about saying what you don't think. It's about doing what you don't say. It's about, you know, all these double standards and the superficial life that you lead, that you want to be, you know, um, in harmony with what, what people expect from you in that part of the world. And then there's the secret life or the secret thoughts. So why? Why shouldn't we? It's our right, it's our basic right as human beings to at least try to experience life as we feel we want to. Okay, try it. Can you sketch out for us then the, the difference between the public face that an Arab woman from the kind of background you're talking about might feel the need to present and those secret thoughts that might be going through her head at the same time? I'm going to give you a very, um, um, let's say, a direct example about something that is happening frequently in Lebanon and, I guess, in other um, countries as well. Um, many Lebanese women, you know that Lebanon is often seen as much more open and you know, uh, liberated place than many other Arab countries. And that is part well, of some, In some aspects it but is, isn't it? But in yeah. some aspects it is. But what as aspects are these? Are these essential aspects? Are these root aspects or just superficial aspects? Well, they're often seen by Westerners like myself as maybe yeah, aspects like, for example, you see women exactly. jogging down the Corniche in the morning. Exactly. Which you, see you wouldn't women, see in Cairo. Of course. And you see women, you know, going dancing till four o'clock in the morning and wearing miniskirts, etc., etc. Et yeah. And that is totally their right to do. It's totally any woman's right to do whatever she chooses to do. But what's happening is that she feels free because of that. But she's not free because she is still discriminated at the level of laws, a woman, a Lebanese woman who marries a, a foreigner cannot pass her nationality to her kids. That means she is treated like a second-hand citizen. A woman in divorce cases is always discriminated against whether she's a Christian or a Muslim. I'm not talking about any particular religion. I'm talking about all of them. So what happens, and, and this takes me back to the example I wanted to tell you. Mm -hmm. This same woman who you see walking or, or jogging on the corniche, going dancing, etc., etc., and who has this normal and, uh, uh, and uh, 
you know, essential need to live her life as she wants to, and she lives also her sexual life as she wants to, when she wants to get married, she goes to a doctor and she gets her virginity back. What does that tell you? Isn't that schizophrenia? Like, I mean, it's well, like, it's, it like it's, makes it's me... It's gross hypocrisy. It's like so much hypocrisy, not not from her, only from her side. From also the expectations, from the, you say. From the man's side, because he's still, you know, he, he has the woman that he wants to go out with and have fun with, and then when he wants to go and get married, he wants a good girl. So he deserves someone, who, a, a woman who goes to a doctor and gets her virginity back. I think they deserve themselves. They deserve each other. Now, what, what would you say to someone who, and maybe I'm sure you've heard this before, and I know you have because you, you deal with it a bit in the book, who say, you know, come on, Jamala, you're an educated Christian woman. I'm not Christian, I'm agnostic. Okay, whatever. But you're brought up as a Christian. I was brought up, unfortunately. What yeah. can I do? Yeah. You're brought up as a Christian, yeah. and that there are people who live in, in pious Muslim households in the southern suburbs in, in Beirut, for example, who might say, no, I, if you don't mind, I want to live like this. I do not want to have the freedom to go out and uh, do what I want and go to bed with whoever I want. and and because I don't want to go to bed with my husband anyway and and you know we have to live our life in this kind of godly way because that is the way to live and frankly your problem Jumana they might say I wouldn't say that but you Be just aware. become a bit too westernized that's your trouble oh my god you're playing the devil devil's part here I don't think that you know um, respecting um, your true self your body your needs means being westernized. I wish it did. It means being a real human being and assuming that essence. I totally respect every person's right to do, to do whatever he wants. I don't want to impose my thoughts on anybody. But when I see something that is going wrong, I just also have the right to say, I don't like this and that's wrong. And going back to that Christian thing, yes, mm -hmm. I was brought up as a Christian. And many people might think that I mean, during, during the Civil Arab War. Christi during the Civil War. Many people might think that Arab Christians are much more open than Arab Muslims. I have to tell you that I got married at 19 just because my father was such a converse, conservative person. He couldn't let me go, he wouldn't let me go to the movies by myself when I was a teenager. So what does that teach you about, you know, making generalizations about religions and stuff like that? I think that I also would like to say that because I talk about religion in this book, I'm not a Christian criticizing Islam. I'm a secular, agnostic human being criticizing religion as a whole and the way it turns people into herds and deprives them from their good judgment. Explain to me something. Um, and this is something that strikes me when I visit the Middle East. And, you know, if you go into uh, any TV set and you zap through the channels late at night, you often, see, uh, you often see old movies, old Egyptian movies from the 60s. And you'll see, you know, women in miniskirts, men drinking whiskey. They get into a mini and they drive off and together to goodness knows what else is going to be going on there. And then you see modern day soap operas and there are women in the hijab, there are women, you know, the, the women are at home, the men are out and about doing what men do. And I mean, that shows a quite serious social change. What went wrong? Well, I was going to say, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I think that's the biggest question of this century. And I'm not only, I mean, you're talking about movies, Egyptian movies from the 50s and the 60s, and you're totally right. But I want to take you even <coughs> further back. If you go back to books that have been written, in Arabic books that have been written in the 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, you would find, you know, erotic writing that... There's, a, there's an excerpt in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, yeah. So you would, you would say... It's challenging for men. What? <laughs> you, would, you would really think, what happened? What went wrong? And, and I mean, like, now, when I did my magazine, like, two years ago, everybody went crazy how could you do this this is so much against our values our culture our language etc etc yeah no, well, that's and the, that's you want to read the excerpt no no Bravo. no 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 no, no. <laughs> not that one 
<laughs> this mag the magazine that you started, though, um, which was, <coughs> I'm right in saying, the first erotic magazine in Arabic. Yeah. And you, you say here, you talk about some of the feedback you, you had from people. You had poisonous, threatening stuff. You deserve to be stoned to death. Yeah. You will rot in hell. You should be ashamed of yourself. How dare you? You're corrupting our kids. God will punish you, we spit in your face, we pray someone throws acid on you. Terrible. I mean, tell me about the magazine, first of all, and what made you do it and why you thought it was a good idea. Okay, so the magazine is called Jasad, which means body in Arabic. And like three years ago, I wanted to start my own editorial project, and I thought I would love to do a cultural magazine. But I didn't want it to be like any other cultural magazine. I wanted it to be new, to be necessary, uh, and to, to be prov provocative in a positive way, not just provocation, you know, the, the kind of provocation that might help people you know, ask questions, because it's important to ask questions. We stopped asking questions in the Arab world. So I thought, since the body was a very important element in my own writing as a poet, since I was, I'm mainly a poet, I would love to do a magazine about the body and try to discuss all these taboos that have entangled the Arab culture and language in the last two centuries, may I say, more or less. And so that's how I started it. The first issue was published in December 2008. We have published now issue number seven. It's a quarterly. Um, it's um, it's more or less 200 pages magazine. Uh, and you get lots of Arab subscriptions? We have lots of subscriptions. It's sold everywhere in Lebanon in bookshops in sealed nylon bags for adults only. <laughs> Top shelf? Yeah. No. Yeah, some people hide it. They even, when they buy it, they put it in, inside another, you know, it's mm. like crazy. And I know that many people who attack it are the main readers. I mean, like, <laughs> I'm cynical enough to imagine yeah. that and I enjoy it I mean like what's the best um, article you've commissioned for it I mean uh, we've have we have in each in each um, um, uh, issue we have like a main dossier that we discuss and we have discussed so far homosexuality in the Arab world we have discussed the issue of virginity that I just told you about uh, we also tackle you know artistic topics like the kiss in arts and literature um, uh, the last issue was about polygamy and that was quite um, uh, a challenge to talk about it and not only about um, polygamy as an institution I'm not talking only about uh, you know having more than one wife but also having more than one partner in your life and um, it's um, I mean I think that some people tell me you're gonna run out of subjects uh, very soon but I don't think so I mean there are so many things that you can talk I mean, about it, it seems to me that your one of your missions is to find a taboo and smash it every time you see a taboo exactly. you want to smash it and and in the Middle Try East to, in the Middle East well in the Middle East there are smash it. but in the Middle East there aren't just a lot of taboos. They, they, the strength of them appears to be growing. Yeah. So we go back to that question about what went wrong, which I probably interrupted you before you finished yeah. um, answering it. So tell me what, in your view, well, went I... wrong because you know, as you say, 10th, 12th century, later than that, there were some, you know, what we would, it's explicit, explicit stuff that people wrote at the time, and maybe they write it now privately, but certainly in the public discourse, there is nothing like that. So what went wrong? <coughs> Well, it's a big question. I cannot claim I can have the answer, Jeremy, because but what, what I can tell you is that it's one of the main reasons why I did uh, Jassad. It was, it's because I wanted to incite writers and artists to think more about this, because talking about a problem is the first step towards healing it. And one of our main obstacles is, is, is that we cannot even discuss things. It's, um, it's like um, we are totally inhibited by all the no-nos that we are facing since we, since we are kids. Now, you mentioned your father already, and he's clearly an influential figure in your life because you also say... I change him, by the way. He's now, he's so open-minded now. Or he pretends to, I don't know. Or he was like that, but he was pretending to be conservative just with his little daughter. Well, maybe you know? he was pretending there because... There are so many scenarios. Be, because you say in the book that you 
that you read the all kinds of uh, adult literature, exactly. including and they were Mackie in his Desaad library. in his library. Exactly. So clearly he was Hidden open to that and kind and of thing. On the top shelves. So yeah, he was out. You got the high steps. You look teetered up on there, and you put it down. And you say in the book too that if you had a daughter and you have two sons, yeah. but if you had a daughter, you'd have bought her the Marquis de Sade for her twelfth birthday. Yes, because I read it when I was twelve. Okay. Now, what did? opening yourselves up, yourself up to those kinds of things. What did that do for you? Okay. How did it change you? It turned me the monster that I am right now, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> no, well, I, I have to tell you something. Um, you know, um, you, you mentioned civil war in Beirut. It started when I was like four years and a half. And I wasn't living in a happy um, family as well. So there was a war outside and a war inside. And the only thing I think that kept me sane and that helped me in that very difficult condition that I was witnessing was literature and it was reading. So um, I started reading very early and my father used to bring me books, you know, for my age. And then the curiosity started um, developing when I was like 11, 12, and he had this huge library because he was an avid reader himself. And I used to wait for him to get out of the house and put a chair and reach for whatever was hidden. And I can tell you that in my case, it, it was such, um, you know, such a positive shock because being in such a closed environment, and having the need to say so many things and not being able to do so. Just it, reading those things helped me feel that it is possible to dream and imagine and write whatever you want. And that is so essential for any writer. So your eyes Just, were opening, your, your horizons were broadening. My horizons were, were, uh, were, were broadened by the reading and also I was liberated from so many, you know, shackles that were, you know, pushing me down and preventing me from saying what I wanted to Who say. Who was putting the shackles on you? Oh, my, my, the way I was educated, the sister school that I went to for 14 years, you know, can you imagine? I mean, like... Nuns. Nuns. For 14 years. And that's the product. <laughs> Another success story. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you can read something for us, I think. Okay. You have an excerpt to read from the book. Yeah, Why don't you sure. do that now? I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, the, the last chapter called I Killed Shahrazad. And which for those who don't know, the by the way, who, who is Shahrazad? Okay, Shahrazad is um, uh, the heroine of a, a very important book called The Thousand and One Nights. It's one of the, one of the major books in, in Arabic literature. Uh, and um, basically, uh, she is a woman who is stuck with a, with a king who, because he was cheated on by his first wife, decided that each night he would marry a new woman and then kill her before dawn. And what did Shahrazad do? Shahrazad just was very clever. And she had read lots of stories, and she had a wide imagination. So she told the man, the king, Shahrayar, she told him, look, we have a deal. I tell you a story each night, but I will not tell you the ending of it. You keep me alive till the next day, and the next day you will find out what the ending is. And that's how she kept te on telling him a story after a story and after a story, and she kept, um, she stayed alive. So my problem with Shahrazad, which is, of course, I don't talk about her in the book unless it, I use her as a metaphor. I have two problems with Shahrazad. <clears throat> That's why I committed the crime. So uh, first of all, she is celebrated um, um, as um, a symbol of rebellion and resistance to patriarchal, uh, you know, oppression and um, the tyranny of the male, which I did not find to be very accurate. Because what this poor woman did was, I mean, what she had was good negotiation, negotiating skills, and that's it. I mean, she told him, I tell you a story, you spare my life. I mean, that's not rebellion. That's, um, that's just, um, you know, compromise. 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 And um, I think we have to get 
past compromise at this point. The second problem is that she is like um, an exotic orientalist fetish. You know, every time there's a woman Arab writer out there in the West, she's called Shahrazad. Shahrazad this, Shahrazad that. And I mean like, so I killed her and I'm gonna tell you why and how. <laughs> I've never been a big fan of Shahrazad. I know that, being an Arab woman and all, I'm supposed to be in admiration, or at least supportive of her, but I am not. It might look, at first sight, as if I were jealous of her. Shahrazad this, Shahrazad that. She just pops out of her Pandora's box every time an Arab woman writer is mentioned somewhere in the world. But I'm not jealous of her. I can't be and I'll explain to you why. You see, Shahrazad is constantly celebrated in our culture as an educated woman who was resourceful and imaginative and intelligent enough to save herself from death by bribing the man with her endless stories. But I've never really liked this bribing the man scheme. For one thing, I believe it sends women the wrong message. Persuade men Give them the things that you have and they want, and they'll spare you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems obvious that this method puts the man in the omnipotent position and the woman in the compromising inferior one. It does not teach women resistance and rebellion, as it is implied when the character of Shahrazad is discussed. It rather teaches them concession and negotiation over their basic rights. It persuades them that pleasing the man, whether by a story, or a nice meal, or a pair of silicone tits, or whatever, is the way to make it in life. And this is considered resistance? Call me short-sighted, short but I don't think so. Thus, I killed her. I killed Shahrazad with the hands of all the men who tried, in different ways and under various masks, to slash my throat. I killed Shahrazad with the hands of all the women who tried, in different ways and under various masks, to make me believe it is okay to have my throat slashed by a man. I killed Shahrazad with the hands of every writer forbidden, whether by an outer or an inner censor, to write what he, she, felt like writing, and had the right to. I killed Shahrazad with the hands of the different religious representatives and leaders, who made me realize the gap between authenticity and blind adherence to anything. I killed Shahrazad with the hands of the numerous stiff conservatives I met in my life, who made me discover the difference between everlasting human ethics and futile values. I killed her with the hands of the Calvin Klein models, the James Bond girls, and every woman who is treated like a delicious piece of meat in magazines, movies, on TV screens, and in real life. I killed her with the hands of my math teacher in fourth grade, who wanted to convince me that boys were good with numbers and girls with cooking. <laughs> I killed Shahrazad with the hands of every scream I did not dare to scream, and every no I did not dare yet to say. I killed Shahrazad with the hands of every person I have been, every person I am now, and every person I will be. Yes, I killed Shahrazad. I killed her in me, and, I'm a, and I am quite determined to kill everything and everyone that even remotely looks or behaves like her in my unconscious imagination and mind. So her sisters, daughters, granddaughters, and all her descendants better close down the concessions business or stay away, far away from me. For there's an angry Arab woman out there. She's got her own not intended for negotiation stories. She's got her own not granted by anybody freedom and life. And she's got the perfect murder weapon. And there's no stopping her now. <laughs> But didn't Sherazad have to survive? Of Aren't course. you being a bit hard on her? I am. I think I don't know what I how I would have done in her place. I mean, I mean. 
You'd have kept, you might have gone have... to your death with a clear conscience. You know, he would have said, fine, I'll chop off your head and when morning comes. Well, I don't know. I'd like to think that I would have done something else, which I'm not going to mention now because you're going to freak out. But... <laughs> don't tell but, me that. <laughs> but um, I think that, I mean, I mean, let's go close down the concessions business. It's time. I think that she did what she had to do, but it's time for us to realize that that was wrong, that we can do something else, that we can do better. Uh, are you defining yourself and Sherazad and women in the Arab world and women in general too much in terms of the way that men view them? Is there not space for a woman to exist outside that? Of course there's a place to, to, for the... And this is the place that I'm talking about. This is the place where I want her and I want myself to go. And it's not a place that you just reach and that's it. It's a constant struggle. It's a constant trip. You have to go there every day. You have to try to reach that place. And it's the, you know, it's a trip that matters. But at least let's take the first step towards that place. How do people break out of this? Now, when you were reading these, these books that opened your eyes considerably, uh, am I right in thinking that you're reading a lot of them in French? Yes. Um, now, you, you were fortunate that you could speak French and you were able to do that. Yes. Now, if you'd grown up not speaking French and without a dad who had a big library, yes. uh, would your life have been different? Yes, my life would definitely have been different. But I think, I like to think that I would have found ways to educate myself because, you know, some women tell me t today, what can we do? I mean, reading is not just in French books. It's available everywhere. I did read in Arabic as well, and we have lots of important and mind-opening books in Arabic. I did not just read in French because Arabic sucks. I love mm -hmm. the Arabic language <laughs> and the Arabic literature. I'm so proud to belong to that to that tradition, to that cultural tradition. I read in French because, you know, in Lebanon, French is like, a mother tongue and um, I felt comfortable in it and actually I found out later on why I was so comfortable in it because I, I also wrote my first book in French I was like my first poems I've written them in French and I thought it's because I love this language it's because I belong to it etc etc but then in my 20s I found out that that was not the case I was just escaping confrontation with Arabic language because what I wanted to say was not sayable in Arabic language well, easily. A Western language is why? More direct? It's like, it's not, not, no, it's not more direct, but there are no taboos. I mean, in, in, in French, so many things have already been said. So it's, it's, it sounded so much e easier for me to express my thoughts. In, in French than to do this battle with the Arabic. And that's when I decided I love the Arabic language, it's my language, and I want to do this battle and I want to, um, you know, try to win it. Mm, and to it's reclaim like a constant, it. It's like a constant struggle. Yeah, I want to make it mine again because it's mine. It's been robbed from me. This book you wrote in English? Yes. Now, why did you choose English? Well, because, I mean, it's, that's, that's how it started. I've, I like to explore myself in different languages, and I've written other books in other languages as well, although I only write poetry mainly in Arabic. But it's because, why did I think about writing this book? It's when, I'm, and, and I tell the story at first, uh, uh, a journalist was interviewing me, and she, she asked me this, she told me this um, phrase, which made me so angry. She said, um, w you know that we, we, many of us in the West are not aware that, you know, Arab women like you exist. And I was so angry when she said that because there are so many Arab women <coughs> even more liberated than me. And I said, and, and then I started thinking when she left, why was I so angry? Because, you know, partly she was right. I mean, and it wasn't her fault. It's also the fault of the mass media effect that prefers the sensationalist side of any story on you know the positive examples if there's a woman you know i'm sure everybody has heard of sakina the woman who's going to be lapidated in um in, in iran it's been like it's met the it has made the had the um, you know the, the titles everywhere in every newspaper that's that's the kind of stories that i mean it's a true story it's terrible 
it's awful. These are criminals. Mm. I'm sure that so many Arab women are uh, committing adultery day after day and that nobody would ever think about throwing stones and killing them that way. But anyway, that's a different story. There are other examples and they do not make often the titles of newspapers like this story does. So I thought I'm gonna write like a letter to this to this woman and try to think about this more and try to explain to her that there's a different Arab woman. And I started writing a letter and then the letter became an article and the article became an essay and that's how this book was born. And I started writing it in English and just <coughs> kept going on in English. I'm sure there are tons of questions out there and we have microphones or a microphone just, which will be passed from person to person. Thank you. And, uh, and right at the back of the room. Hi. Just wanted to ask you, do you think most Arab women secretly want what you want and are just afraid to go for it? Or do you think right now, this minute, they want something different? Well, I wouldn't allow myself to generalise about what other Arab women are thinking, but I know that a good <laughs> number of them uh, want um, to be, you know, uh, reconciliated with themselves and their lives. They want to be the decision makers about their fates and not just an accessory. Um, but I'm, I also am aware that there's another group of, of Arab women who are brainwashed since childhood to think that the lives that they are leading are their own choice. And sometimes these women say stuff like that also out of, you know, pride because they don't want to you know, admit that they have been forced down this path. So there are lots of examples and lots of different, uh, you know, lots of different experiences out there. And I cannot, cannot pretend that all of them want my life. I'm sure, mm, 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 I, I, I'm sure that some women do not want the kind of life that I'm leading. The gentleman there has had his hand up very insistently. Wait for the microphone, it's just coming your way. So your right shoulder. <clears throat> I like to make a, a couple of points. You see about why things have moved so. But bad. don't forget the question. I, I'm not hearing you very well. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, the query was when uh, Jeremy mentioned about the 1960 and all that, and why things have gone back, and also the question of Sakina. Now you see the BBC has got very bad habit of not expecting. There was a program on Sunday morning where this Sakina case was discussed. And the chap who was learned professor from the Tehran who was about to explain, but she, he was not given a chance. The Bays have got a lurid tendency to describe. Now, there is so many implications about stoning. Okay, it's ham. not as simple. And let's, secondly... Let's just have a question. Uh, ask ask, yes. ask Kivan a question. Yeah. And also, I want to mention that so long as we, I mean, the American, Anglo-American makes more incursion on Islamic world, the more reaction would get. Take a case of Taliban or Hamas or anything like that. Unless we withdraw entirely and make a commercial arrangement with those countries. Iran, if you look at in Musadek time, was so democratic. Zaire was, Afghanistan was so democratic. Women went to university, they had a doctor, but once the incursion came uh, by Russia or America, the reaction are uh, we Okay, let, let's, let's, put, let's uh, put, put that point to, just, uh, to no, that last point I want to make. Very quickly, please, because other people want to ask 60, questions. I I I never saw much hijab. Now you see, it is a reaction by the women the Islam, they, they go back to religion because they think only salvation is the Islam for them. Okay, what about that very good point then that the, the incursions of the West into the Muslim world have brought forth an extreme response? I think that's indulging in putting all the responsibility on other parties instead of assuming and handling your own faults and problems. I'm sorry, but this is how it is. It is not our fault. I mean, it's partly your fault, but it's not only your fault. I mean, it's I, like I said, in every misunderstanding, there are two parties that are doing something wrong, not just one. 
But the, I mean, what about? I don't that? like this blaming only okay, blaming the West. Okay, let's try and stay away theory. from the blame game. But you know, the thing about the West is that culturally, economically, it's very powerful, and in this era too of. Uh, global broadcasting, satellite television and what have you, you just have to turn on your TV to see all of that. I mean, it is, not the, it is the case, is it not, that some people are repelled by that and there is a negative response to it. Yeah, but it could be. Why should it, this negative response uh, should be becoming an extremist? Well, and perhaps becoming... people feel very threatened by it. I don't think that the response to threat should be, you know, closing down on the other. I think there are more decent and, uh, you know, um, clever ways to deal with those threats than just closing down and uh, wearing a burqa and stoning women and, you know, blaming the West for all your problems. Right, so the next question. Who's got one? Uh, um, wait, 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 just wait one second for the microphone. This is going out all have, over the world on the World Wide Web. Have you yourself found yourself in danger? How do you move around Lebanon if someone recognizes you? Do you? Do no, you, I don't do have you, any problem. Do, do, do you no. wear any sort of disguise? Or? No! <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you don't live anywhere. Yeah. No. No, I, I mean, I, like, I've had these, you know, um, um, these emails, and I just decided when I, when I started doing the magazine, I knew what I was, was going to face, obviously, you know. And um, I decided that I was not going to be intimidated by, by these things. And I did not let them change my life, especially since my office is my, in my own house. And that was quite dangerous because I have two kids and uh, they live with me. But, I mean, it's not an act of courage. Let me explain that. I'm a very, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm a, I, I get scared very easily. It's more being obstinate and, and passionate about what I think I want to do and what I think is my right to do. So no, I just lead a, a normal life. For, for, for a period when I started getting too many hate mails at the beginning, now they have calmed down, I stopped driving my car, but that's the only thing that I did. And then I, I, I came back to, to normality, no, no. Yes. Sir. Good evening. Yeah, I'm very interested in what you're saying. Um, I'm, I'm Anglo-Arab. I've grown up with many uh, stereotypes of Arab men and whatever that I've been exposed to, so I agree with what, what you're saying completely. I have two questions. One is, are you only going to publish this in English or Arabic as well for the Western world Arabs and the Arab world Arabs? Or even better, stick it on the internet for free in Arabic so all those only Arab-speaking and reading women in the Arab world can read it, maybe, if they can have internet access. And the other question was, uh, do you think there's a space for an angry Arab guy version <laughs> that maybe your brother would write <laughs> about stereotypes as well? I definitely think that there are lots of angry Arab men out there. And um, I mean, many of them are trying to express themselves. I'm not saying that only the woman is a... Is a, is a has, is facing problems and is angry. I'm sure that we are sharing a very, you know, um, gloomy fate together. And I don't like the separation between men and women, but it's because the theme of this book was, you know, a kind of, it was a kind of personal book. And um, so I, it was a very much from, from my own perspective and my own experience. I definitely want to publish it in Arabic. But I don't want to give it to someone to translate it. I'm going to have to write it myself. And I'm, I'm doing so many things at the same time that I don't think it's going to happen before one year at, at least. But I'm definitely going to publish it in Arabic. I've already published some excerpts of it in the newspaper, so, um, yeah. Is it about homosexual men? Because they must be really angry. <laughs> or, or do they have their little I think, underground? There must be a... You, you know, know, not only homosexual... Of course, homosexual men and women are very angry, but not only them. There are, you know, men who, who want to just be free and live their life in a normal way. I think they're angry too. You don't just need to belong to a, this, you know, um, 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 a, a very directly discriminized um, uh, group in order to be angry. There are so many things that make you angry in that part of the world. And here, of course. I'm sure there are lots of angry people here as well. Next question. Uh, the lady there with the pencil, the pen. Thank you for 
uh, this lovely evening, truly. And uh, I must congratulate you for, for liberating yourself from within. And that's what an Arab woman or Muslim woman needs before she, to she speaks about liberation. But I would like to discuss with you, don't you think that you can never, I mean, you can never be independent unless you are financially independent. It's very important. Absolutely. And the way that women are raised in the Middle East does not make them independent. On the contrary, it, 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 it embeds with them the sense of dependency on the male, whoever it is in the family, that that, that put the shackles on women. So won't you sort of divert your energy to address this issue, particularly in women laws and women rights, uh, you know, uh, as to, uh, and co especially when it comes to religions, because they think that, you know, this religion have given women rights and this uh, did not and so on. And it's all nonsense and rubbish. So would you consider doing, so, you know, standing up for such a thing? To, to talk about the inequality and the injustices that is put on women. The other thing I would like, uh, your magazine, Jasad, is it in Arabic or in English? It's in Arabic. I did it because I wanted to do it in Arabic. I wouldn't have done it if it was. Well done. I just would like to draw your attention mm -hmm. for, a po po for a poem for uh, Nizar Qabbani about virginity. Um, it's, it's a fantastic poem that, that might help you put the, the right uh, angle in, uh, in virginity issue in the Arab world. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, actually, a womanhood and uh, femininity and all these issues are one chapter, one important chapter of this book. And it's definitely very important for a woman to be financially independent. And you know what makes me angry? Because I'm always angry. I was like at the beach with my son the other day, and I saw two examples that you couldn't possibly understand. One example was a mother with her five-year-old son. This five-year-old son was crying for some reason. And she slapped him, and she told him, stop acting like a girl. Only girls cry. And she, this woman is like a 25-year-old woman. She's not an old woman belonging to the old generation. And I thought, what's happening? Another example, after like a couple of hours, was like two teenagers talking together about cars, two girls. They were like 12 or 13. And she, one girl was saying to the other, when I'm going to get married, I'm going to let my husband buy me a Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, when are we going to think, when I'm going to grow up, I'm going to make money, I'm going to buy myself my own Porsche. I mean, that's basically that's the thing. That's, <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's get yeah. the microphone up front. The gentleman here in the cream jacket has had his hand up very insistently. Prakash. Can I give you a third example, which is <clears throat> not so funny but tragic? Have you dealt with genital mutilation? Of course. And, I've... and it's always the mothers who drag their daughters, not the fathers, it's the mothers. Yes. That's something for you to cover in your magazine. Yes. My question is about the word confessions in the title of your book. Yes. Now, I know it's a cliche, people, people write confessions, or is it something to do with your Catholic or Christian no, upbringing? No, it's because I was, uh, it's, I killed Shahrazad, it's a crime, and you confess a crime. That's okay. the only and, reason. Uh, okay. It's definitely the not follow -up religious is, intended. The I mean, follow-up like, is that if you confess to a crime, you're going to be tried and punished. This is what's happening. <laughs> what, <laughs> what sort of sentence do you think will be adequate for your crime? I hope it's always going to be a wonderful public like tonight. I mean, that's the only oh. sentence I, I enjoy. Uh, lady, that hand went shot up there. Um, you've talked about the view of Arab women uh, in the West. What about the view of Western women in the Arab world? Exactly. That's another cliche. I always talk about that. It's not in the book. But I always like to say that, I mean, the cliches are um, mutual. And, um, you know, and What's the, the cliche problems, about Western women? Oh, she's like, you know, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but. Also, the crisis is mutual because as much as I talk about how insulting a burqa is for a woman, it's also very much insulting for a woman to be treated like a piece of meat behind a glass vitrina. These 
two examples might seem contradictory at first sight, but they're not. They join themselves. They're like the two facets of the same coin. And they express um, um, a problematic relationship with your identity as a woman and how you want to be seen and who is imposing on you the way you see yourself and you treat yourself and you behave. So um, yeah, definitely, there are lots of, lots of um, mutual problems and misunderstandings. Yes? Uh, wait, hang, wait one second, microphone coming. This has all got to be on the record. <laughs> I love it what you're saying about Arab women, but our, my particular interest is the invisibility of, of women in the West, women in this Can't country. Hear you. Can't hear you. Well, well, it's not working. It's not working. <coughs> Is that better? No. <laughs> uh, now it's working. OK. I have okay. to be quite close. Um, I'm interested in the invisibility of women in, in this country. And I think it's something, I think there's a number of factors. In Britain, in Britain. Yes, in Britain, yes. At the last election, um, fairly obviously, not too many women <laughs> came out there. But um, if you go back in time, there are cycles like this. And it's partly to do with religious fundamentalism or, what, or whatever ilk at the moment. Um, but also, uh, it's a societal thing, but the men and the women connive, actually, not necessarily choosing so to do, but that women's place is either behind the burqa or the vetrina. And it seems to me that um, so many English women are invisible, and people like Zaha Hadid, if she's mentioned as she was in the metro yesterday, it's a real put down and how completely stupid she is. And she's Arab or not, she's one of the most intelligent women out there, making a fantastic career, known throughout the world. So what you're saying about they focus on the stereotypical stoning or whatever else, we need more reference to um, Arab women like yourself and more magazines like yours, bringing out the positives of whether they're Western or Arab women. Would you comment on how we could do more, you know, we could see more um, Arab women <coughs> profiled through your magazine or? Yeah, well, I think that um, um, the first problem with, um, I mean, there are two problems that are making Arab women invisible. The first one is people who don't want to see them, you know? And then the other problem is that they don't want to be seen. And so if you, if you really want to find a solution, we have to deal with the, both problems. Why don't you want to see them? Why are they invisible to you? Why are you ignoring them? And on the other hand, why are they accepting to be ignored? And I think it's going to take a lot of time and, and it needs a lot of awareness and anger, anger. Angry women. <laughs> in order for them to uh, and for you to, to get to that point. Jamana, you, you talked a bit about the need for financial independence. That's crucial. The reality of it, though, isn't it, is that for many people, actually not just in the Middle East, but in many places, that no one in the family is financially independent. The man might be out there working, but he's barely scraping a living from day to day, and he has no independence financially. Uh, the woman is, you know, at home working really hard, struggling with a lot of kids very often. So, I mean, how do you square that particular circle? Because, you know, here we are from the point of view, you, you're doing okay, you're a successful writer, you've got a bit of money. But actually there in the poor districts of Beirut, no one's got financial independence. And so how can they break out of this cycle that you, you know, quite rightly condemn? Well, I was, I mean, my family was very poor. The only thing that they managed and stressed on doing was giving us an education. Mm -hmm. And so if I have managed with such, so few instruments, except for education which, and ambition, which are key to do well. I think that any woman can do so well. Any person can do. I'm not exceptional. I'm like just any other human being. You just need you're to You're doing yourself want. down a bit, aren't you? I mean, you know, I'm just waiting for, I'm fishing for compliments. Okay. You know? right. <laughs> sort of the gentleman over there had his hand up some time ago. Microphone's going over. Uh, Shumana, um, what would you say are the main um, uh, literary influences on you of uh, among the many uh, <coughs> Arab 
women writers who have touched in whole or in part on the same areas that you are now uh, touching on. I think this book's touching on aspects of this yeah. issue have been written for over 40 years and they're still being written in quite large numbers. Exactly. And I would like to cite them because they are in my book and I, um, in the last chapter, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I have paid a tribute to them because I, um, I said how much I owe to all these women who have, you know, so I would like to, um, if you just let me. Allow me at this point to repeat, not all Arab women lack a backbone. Of that, it is proof enough for us, Westerners and Arabs, to read the essays of intellectuals such as May Ziedi, Huda Sha'rawi, Ital Adnan, May Khsoub, Fatima Mernisi, Lor Mghaizil, and Khalida Saeed, to discover the novels of writers such as Ahdaf Swaif, Alawiya Subah, Huda Barakat, Hanan al-Sheikh, and Sahar Khalifi, to see the works of artists such as Zaha Hadid, Muna Hatoum, Helen Khal, and Ghada Amir, to understand the poems of Joyce Mansour, Saniya Saleh, Nazik al Malaika, Nadia Twaini, and Fadwa Tukan, to watch the plays of Jalila Bakkar, Raja bin Ammar, Lina Khouri, Darina al Jundi, and Nidal al Ashkar, to enjoy the movies of Jocelyn Saab, Randa Shahal, Daniel Arbid, Layla al Marrakishi, and many, many others. In fact, this testimony is also a modest tribute to all the above mentioned wonderful writers thinkers, artists, and scholars, and to each and every Arab woman, whether prominent or anonymous, who, despite the numerous challenges, obstacles, and threats that face her, still manages to make a difference in life, in hers, thus in ours. That's a very good answer to a very direct question. Uh, microphone here, please. Here it comes. Thanks. First of all, welcome, and it's a real pleasure to hear you. Very refreshing. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this as from one emancipated Arab woman to another. Um, I just, I'm just a bit concerned that there is an implication, I, I may have misunderstood you, which is coming across, that uh, Arab women need to uh, do something much more themselves, to work on themselves, and then life can be very different. Now, if that is correct, are you not underestimating the effect of um, male hatred of women in the Arab world? And I use this advisedly. There's male hatred of women all over the world. But in Arab society, it's very powerful, very intimidating. And uh, with the best will in the world, uh, isn't it important to make clear that uh, this is a real obstacle to women? Um, and how, uh, I mean, have you tackled that? How, how should they deal with it? First of all, I don't think there is male hatred. I think the problem is male condescendence and um, under estimating women. That's the real problem because hatred uh, provokes a strong reaction and if the problem was hatred, women would have been so much better off by now. I think that the problem is not only, I don't like to consider the man as the ultimate enemy. I'm against this theory because it has, it has done us no good. It did us no good at all. I think the problem is men and women alike. And like I said, many women hate themselves, if we're talking about hate, and underestimate themselves, sometimes much more ferociously than men do. So this is why I always stress on the importance of the woman believing in herself and trying to make, to work on her own self before coming to the other you know, uh, challenges that she has to face in her relationship with the other, whoever the other is, whether it is another woman or a man, etc., etc. Of course, we live in a patriarchal society. And let me tell you one thing, because I travel so much, it's not only in the Arab world. Unfortunately, it's everywhere. We have to say that. 
but it's not the only problem and it shouldn't make the woman say what can I do men are so bad no I mean that would I mean I don't think that did anything for us in the last 30 40 years except for a few gains and I also think because you know there are two types of struggles here I belong to one of them I like individual struggles without underestimating the importance of you know the struggles that should go at the level of laws and you know all these more institutional kind of you know facing the problem both are needed as much as the struggle at the level of institutions and laws is important as much as the individual struggle is important it's all I mean it's very important the perspective that you have because you know when you're asking for your rights when you're a woman asking for your rights you're already putting yourself in the weak position you're asking and he's the grantor and he's gonna give you what you want and you're just you know a, a rib but you're not a rib you were born as independent and as you know free as he was and so it's important for you to conceive yourself as such in order to have a more equal relationship and you don't need to become like a man in order to prove that you're strong you have to be strong in your by being a woman 100 percent and you can do that so it's just about you know getting rid of all these ready images that they stick that they stuck in your uh, in your mind since you are a, a little a little girl and it's difficult i'm not saying it's easy but both struggles are important now your book in in many ways is a is a manifesto for change you're calling for a lot of change yes. and in your remarks here tonight you're broadening it out to other aspects of life as well and one thing you say that struck me in your book was um you were talking about change and you said that uh, being an Arab means facing an endless series of on passes, totalitarianism, corruption, sexism, on pass of the partiality of the West, etc. You name other bad things. And you say that Arabs need to keep attacking the wall, confining them from inside. It cannot be brought down from outside. So how then, bearing in mind that it's not just <coughs> social conservatism that Arabs need to deal with it's also the fact that there's political authoritarianism in many countries uh, how do you how do, how do you think people should go about trying to bring about that change because yeah, it's a massive problem do I look like Einstein to you I mean like <laughs> yeah I'm, this I'm is hoping like you the might most difficult question in the world it's a fundamental question how can I solve this come on it's a fundamental question problem. you've got an opinion about it let's hear it <laughs> it's like, well the road is long and difficult and narrow and but I'm it's rocky, really it's convinced hard, yeah. it's rocky because you know sometimes people ask me why haven't you moved and I sometimes I'm very tempted because I could move easily to, mm -hmm. to live abroad if I haven't moved till now it's because I really believe in the fact that a war can a wall can only be torn down from inside <laughs> I can tell you there are lots of bruises here mm -hmm. I mean it's like banging your head and banging your head over and over again and you feel sometimes that like nothing can change this particular moment in our political history is like a very dim moment as far as I'm very well like, dim, it's, dim. It's, it's very gloomy it's it's negative but I, I, I don't want to indulge myself in pessimism because that's the, the favorite hobby of, of many Arabs as well. And um, I mean, it's, it's like there are so many things to be done. And sometimes people tell me, well, I mean, was really, you know, is, is it really that important for a woman to be free and liberated and to talk about sexuality? I mean, we have so many problems in the Arab world. Yes, we do, but you know, each each person has the right to choose his battles, and I chose this one. I'm not saying that I'm going to change the whole world. How, how important is it to talk about sex? <coughs> I think it's 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 more than the fact that it's important to talk about sex. It's important to be able, if you want to, to talk about it. So the problem is when they tell you you shouldn't talk about this. This is bad. This is haram. This is 
shameful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's when all the complex, you know, all the complexes, uh, um, you know, um, begin um, developing in you. It's not about how important it is to talk. It's about having the ability as a right, if you want to, if you want not only talk about it. How about living it? I mean, living it is a problem as well. In the so, how, so how depressing is it for you then when you see more and more women? Um, wearing the veil of different sorts, different kinds of veils, and sometimes you see their mothers maybe wearing a little scarf or maybe not even that, and then the daughter with the whole thing, gloves, you know, you name it. I mean, how I does know. that, when you see that, what do you think? I'm angry. You know why? Mostly I'm angry because many people, many, many uh, people say this is like um, a, tradi a traditional dress and it's going back to, to the, it's like a cultural also distinction. It protects and I say, women, the argument of being, it yeah, protects yeah, women come, from being seen come, as a piece of meat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to that, I'm going to come to that. I'm gonna, I, it makes them be seen even more as a piece of meat. But first of all, let's talk about this tradition. I mean, why? The, does the woman has have to be the sole bearer of this tradition? I would love to see a man in a burqa. I would really love to. Have you ever seen a man in a burqa? Yeah, one. Really? Yeah. Where? It's a colleague of mine at the BBC who's dressed as a woman. Okay, that doesn't that doesn't count, no, doesn't Jeremy. Count, no. That doesn't count. Didn't make a good woman. Yeah, and then <laughs> and then the other thing is, it's like they say it's to protect them. Why? Because they are seen as a, not only as an object of seduction and temptation. And the poor Arab man, you know, he cannot. You See know, six year old girls with headscarves. He scarves. cannot fight this, you know, continuing, you know, um, uh, <coughs> impulse towards this object. So, so she ha instead of him, you know, dealing with his own problems, she has to just uh, uh, cancel her presence in order to help him. Now, I mean, how can, can that be healthy? I can see from a point of view of a, of a young man growing up in a society where uh, there are big taboos about sex. And, you know, as a young man, you've got strong impulses in that direction, probably. And looking around, I, I guess that a lot of these young guys who aren't married don't have many outlets for all of that. What's it like for a young girl growing up in that? I mean, as a male, I find it harder to empathize with that. What's it like for a young girl? Growing it depends. Up, Who is society. this young girl? Okay. Generalize or be specific. Up to you. <laughs> well, it's. Um, I think. I mean, I know that people always talk about how women, especially, always talk about how insulting um, uh, the gaze of the man can be when they're like you feel that their their eyes are drooling, and it is. It's it feel, it makes you feel you know bad. But you, can, you have ways to fight that. You have a very important and efficient instrument, and it's training yourself to ignore that. And to say, I am here, I exist, and I'm not going to let you intimidate me by the fact that you are treating me as a piece of meat, and I'm not going to cancel myself just because you have you know, your sexual issues. And it's not my problem to heal my whole society just because I belong to a society where sex is a taboo. So, I mean, I'm like, why should I pay for a sin that I did not commit? Let's get another question. We'd like, oh my goodness, millions. <laughs> uh, now, now, who hasn't asked you? You've asked questions before, so let's wait. Uh, ne right next to you. Um, listen. Uh, oh, yeah, well, have, yeah. And the lady, give it to the guy, then, she's got the mic. Yeah. Some of the lady, then the bloke. Yeah, right. hi. So, previously you talked about um, the movies, Egyptian movies in 1950s and today's movies and the difference and you asked what went wrong. So I was going to ask, do you believe the role of religion has to do in this change, both in politics and society, in, because everything's sort of politicized in Lebanon, I think. So do you think religion has to pl do something with the change? Of course, I think it's obvious if we are seeing now, um, um, you know, women who are veiled or wearing a burqa or etc., or um, you know, a men who blow themselves and call themselves martyrs. It's because of religion, and it's because of religion that is taking you to a place that is not a better spiritual place, like it's supposed religions are supposed to do. It's taking you to a place where you are you become prejudiced and closed and you're refusing the other who, who doesn't think like you and you don't accept him and that's the problem 
and that's the problem with extremism and not only in Islam in Christianity in Judaism in everything you know all religions when they take you to these ugly places where you become hateful of others and instead of giving you you know this is why I always insist on on human ethics and values I mean we don't need that uh, we just need to believe in generosity and love and you know treating others decently and going towards the other and that's all we need why do we need this promise of of heaven i would like to read an excerpt from the book about this particular topic which could explain better my um, my thought Okay, so now it's an excerpt from <clears throat> St. Paul's first letter to Timothy. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach or to use authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not seduced, but the woman being seduced was in the transgression. <laughs> Yet she shall be saved through childbearing if she continues in faith and love and sanctification with sobriety so here i start so is there really a difference between being a muslim and a christian woman in the arab world today is it truly easier is it accurate and fair to assume that christianity is all about love and forgiveness and embracing the other and islam is all about bigotry and evil and killing innocent people not if you are blindly pious, not if you're vehemently anti-secular, not if you abide literally by your religion's rules, whatever that religion is, and surrender your own judgment to a supposedly higher one and naively believe every single word your religious figures tell you, and adapt your life and visions and actions to the endless vicious circle of laws and recommendations that someone else has thought and conceived on your behalf and decided should work for you and will grant you an unconditional entry to paradise. This is how I have come to think of it, with all due respect to people who believe in fairy tales and need them. What could paradise be other than a wonderful illusion invented by a few geniuses? Sometimes they are called prophets, other times saints and mystics, depending on the cultural and social contexts. In order to control the masses, promising them in return a reward that they will never be able to grant, or at least a reward with no guarantee of delivery. Can you imagine an easier, yet more Machiavellian trick pulled on millions and millions of minds, eager to be comforted in their fears and doubts and day-to-day -day challenges and crises? Do you really want to bet your life and principles and behavior and choices on that? Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be healthier and more rewarding to set for yourself an earthly life ethic and morality based on decency, respect and universal humanistic values? Wouldn't it be healthier and more rewarding to decide for yourself what your mistakes are and try to correct them? Plus, if paradise did indeed exist, who'd want to go there, honestly? A place where everything is perfect? A place where a man and a woman were punished for picking an apple and having sex? Really? Give me a break. <laughs> We're into the last 10 minutes now. Um, back of the room, that hand, yep, yeah, mic's over your shoulder. <clears throat> uh, Jumana, thank you for a very, very stimulating evening so far. Um, I'm interested by something that you were suggesting earlier, which is that you can publish your magazine in Lebanon, and it's probably the only country in the Middle East where you could operate with the level of freedom that you have. Are you aware of any kind of constituency for Jassad outside Lebanon? I mean, how far are you speaking to people in the rest of the Arabic-speaking region? And um, how far also are you, are you aware of being censored as well in the, in the magazine outside Lebanon? I would imagine, for example, that in the Gulf, it's not very easy to buy your magazine. Yes. Well, um, when I first started, I, I applied. We applied to all ministries of information in all the Arab world. And it's, it's been refused everywhere. But what is happening is that we have many subscribers 
especially in the Gulf. And we send them by courier, and it's, it's, it's going there. So there you go. I mean, this is why I say in the book that censorship nowadays is stupid. It's, it's, it's useless. How could you pretend to be, you know, and plus, it makes you even want more what they are depriving you from. So it's its own worst enemy. This is what censorship does. I mean, yeah, but we do have, I mean, we have a broad reach, reach in the Arab world. Thank you. Lady yes. there, you haven't asked a question yet. It's really going back to the burqa again. You're talking of it being imprisoning. Um, what do you think of Western countries that liberate women by trying to outlaw the burqa, like France and Belgium? Uh, because, of course, there are some women who resist that and say that it's our right to wear the burqa. Is this just another element? I just wonder if you I have I think I totally respect and support France's decision to ban the burqa because France was built as a secular republic, and it has always been like that. And, and it's amazing because of that. And I have learned to respect it because of that. So I totally support that decision. That's my stance. But what about those people who say, no, hang on, it's meant to be a free country. Self-expression is free here. I choose to express myself by wearing this garment. I think they should go elsewhere. <laughs> That's pretty clear. Um, you've been trying to ask a question for a while at the back there. Um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Germana for, for being here tonight. Um, I just wanted to ask, I mean, you... I'm sorry, can you, can you speak a little sure, bit louder? Sure, sure, sorry. Nice and close to the microphone. Nice and close um, to the mic. Is that better? Yes. Uh, th thank you, Joanna, for, for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, I was just interested, the, the extract that you just read from your book was obviously quite negative um, about religion, and you seem to see it broadly as quite a negative force in the Arab world. Um, but I'm interested that in your list of female authors, you also um, uh, said, uh, you mentioned Fatima Marnisi, who I think would probably describe herself as a Muslim, and there are other women like her who try and sort of work within the Islamic tradition and would call themselves Islamic feminists. Um, and I mean, given that, as other people have pointed out over the past 20 years or so, the main political movement in the Middle East has been political Islam, do you see any sort of lasting value in Islamic feminism? Do you think that has the potential to, to contribute to the advancement of Arab women? Or, or do you think the Arab world needs to move down the path of the separation of church and state, such as in France? And if so, wouldn't you admit that that's fairly unlikely? Sorry, it's quite a convoluted question. But. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, like I said, I respect um, uh, Fatima Zmernisi's work and what she keeps on doing uh, in that regard. But for me, saying Islamic feminism or Christian feminism is like an, an oxymoron, you call it? That's how yeah. it is for me. Military intelligence. I mean, one. because religion, I mean, has done everything from the start from the tale of the genesis from the from the point and this is why i talk about lilith i don't know if you've ever heard of lilith i mean we have we heard this we hear always the story of eve the woman who was created from adam's rib so she is the part of the whole but uh, one of my books is called lilith's uh, return and it's about the real woman the first woman she i mean Supposedly, in that mythology, man and woman were created at the same time in the same manner. Why do you think religion has opted to choose the second version? Because being a part, transforming the woman into a part of the male is a way to say that she is just an accessory. She is just a part of the whole, which is the male. So that's why I don't think that religion and women's rights go together. And there are so many examples about that. I mean, like, for example, they tell me, look, uh, um, in, in Islam, a man can take four wives. That's so unfair. And I tell them, have you ever seen a priest who's a woman? And why does the pope always have to be a man? So it's like that everywhere. I mean, like, it's... Um, Okay, uh, so uh, wait for the microphone. Yeah. Jumana, do you, by killing Shahrazad, do you think you are harming Shahrayar or you are doing him a favor? 
<laughs> I, I like to think I'm doing him a favor because I, need, I think that the man has come to a point where he also needs a real partner and not an accessory. He doesn't need someone who negotiates with him. He needs someone who he can respect and accept as she is. And this is why I like to think of a world where there's no more, you know, um, uh, patriarchal or matriarchal, you know, versions of, of the world because both of them have proved to be so bad. I think it's important for us to learn to, you know, walk hand in hand together. I know it sounds like utopia, but it can be done. It can be done when we respect each other, when we accept the fact that we are equal yet very different and we insist on staying different, and that's important. I mean... But you and me, Juman, are the spoon of honey in a big pool of water. I'm not sure I'm honey. I mean, like... No, I mean, you know, I am agnostic like you. I'm a secular. And I suffer because of the political system I live in. Yeah, I know, but the you know, but if of the system. no, and we're I not victims. Like you should work. never say that. We, if you see yourself as a victim, you're doomed. You're dooming everything in in advance. You you shouldn't say that, and you shouldn't say that you can do nothing, because you know this is the kind of attitude that I mean you should think that there's something to be done. You can do Individual something. Individual struggle, okay? It's, yeah, this this is what I'm talking um, about. It's always better than nothing. We're nearly out of time. We've got time for a couple more questions. <coughs> Thank you, Jumana. I'm another um, angry Arab woman here, and I agree sure you with are. a lot of things you said. Um, and I'll thank you for voicing out that anger. Um, my question is, your magazine, just said, I haven't had a look at it yet, but the question is, has it, do you think it has increased your popularity and make people more curious about you uh, as a writer and author? Or has it really decreased your popularity because people labelled you as the evil Arab woman that writes about sex? Well, I think they have both balanced themselves because, you know, um, Jassad has created such a division and an opinion about what I do. And since I'm really, you know, like I said, passionate about it and believe in it and convinced that I want to do it, I, I couldn't allow myself to do these kind of calculations. You just go ahead with your dream and you deal with the consequences. If it did give me sometimes more popularity or less, it's a collateral damage and I was willing to accept that right from the start. So we have got time to say two more questions. And very insistent hand has been up all You've through that answer. For like an hour. Right down the back. What? You've been saying a couple more questions for like the last I'm interested to hear more from you. Come on, you, uh, we've got a couple more minutes before our time has go, go, sir. Hello. Hello, Jumana. Thank you for coming, Christopher. Can I ask uh, Jeremy first and then Jumana, is there anything that either they can do or any of us all together can do to save the life of the woman in the Tehran jail? Yes, I mean, well, you can sign the petition. I here. have done that. There is a petition, you know. Yeah, there is a petition. But how far has it got? The next thing happens is that she's punished corporally, I mean, horribly. I know, I know. Well, it's what terrible. is the BBC capable of doing? I think very little, to be quite honest question. with you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not about the BBC tonight, but I, I can say that um, we are uh, we are one of the main enemies as far as the, the regime in Tehran is concerned. I don't think we can help. We've helped to publicize the, the issue, uh, but in terms of in terms of my, will they respond to public opinion in places like this? I wonder. Who knows? Um, I hope so. Uh, Oscar, okay, last let me lady, just take uh, you, you, Oscar as well. Which one? Because he's been, Oscar has been trying to ask a question. Okay, all right. You haven't had your hand up enough then. Okay, this is the last question. Anyone, any more questions? You've got to buy a book. <laughs> or we all do. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jumana, for inspiring, inspiring us as you always do. Uh, my question concerns the kind of anger that you describe in your book. You have described it as an individual kind of anger. However, you also pointed out that it has a, a political element. If so, how can we use this anger so that it drives us towards enthusiasm without also driving us towards fanaticism? Yeah, well, I don't think that, I, at least not my kind of anger, could, could um, 
I don't think that fanaticism comes out from anger. It comes out from blindness. And um, the kind of anger that I'm talking about is the positive one, the one that makes you say, enough, I want to do something about it. And that's a healthy anger. That's, I think that's one of the main, you know, um, it's, it's a fueling system that makes us, you know, it's a drive that makes us go on and move forward and try to change things for ourselves, in our, even in our daily lives. Uh, and um, uh, what can we do? Like I said, I believe in, in this individual rage and in that space. But I also said that it's also very important to have a second path moving along this individual one. And it's the path of, you know, people working more on the institutional and political level. Anger, especially in such a case, is always political. I, t I have tried to avoid politics all my life because I despise it. But you cannot. You cannot avoid when you say what I'm saying. You cannot avoid being political because, you know, being angry, being an angry Arab woman is a political stand, after all. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't want to sound desperate because anger can also be self-destructive. And I have tried all my life to, to use it as something to, to build over destruction and not to make me destroy myself. So I think that if we consider it in that under that light, if we try to use it in that way, I mean, like anger for Sakina, I think can make ch things change. I'm sure it can. Maybe not for her. I hope it can for her. But maybe for future, you know, for the future. We have to believe in that. It's not it's not being naive. It's being human. I mean, we are human beings after all. How can we accept that a woman is stoned to death in the 21st century because she committed adultery? I mean, how awful and, and insulting is it for all of us? I mean, for all of us. Yeah, so. men and women. Um, Jamana, yes. thank you so much for everything thank you've you. done tonight for us. Thank you.